what I see coming in the horizon from where I sit is a tsunami heading towards a, the consumer in terms of the consumer being in charge of their destiny, which I think is a fantastic tsunami. But what I think the companies are lacking is the vision to see that. Hey, Ted Huff here from FinTech Confidential. Are you struggling with payment technologies and feeling left behind in the digital commerce revolution? No worries. Let me introduce you to MPC 2023, the premier event for payments leaders. This is your chance to shake hands and rub shoulders with the world's top experts in payments, loyalty, blockchain, digital currencies, cybersecurity, consumer privacy, and other emerging fintech solutions, connecting you directly with the future of commerce. And if you haven't already, mark your calendars for August 23rd through the 25th and join me and Fintech Confidential at the Westin Atlanta Perimeter North. Now here's the best part. When you sign up for Fintech Confidential notifications, you will receive a discount up to 100% off. Yeah, you heard it right, up to 100% off. So what are you waiting for? Sign up now at www.fintechconfidential.com forward slash notifications. Don't let the future of commerce pass you by and join me at MPC in Atlanta from August 23rd through the 25th, where it's all about the movement of money. Welcome to Fintech Confidential, bringing you the people, tech, and companies that change how you pay and get paid. Sam, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Money Hub hails out of Bristol, England, and is a leading open finance platform company that has been advocating for the power of open data that is consumer and consent driven. I shouldn't say consumer, but consent driven to give access to the financial data, to do what you need to do, to be able to look at, to manage, and to maintain, or even grow um, your money. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is that the initiation of payments was kind of like snuck in there a little bit. Now you've worked with some very prestigious companies and created some very interesting FinTech in your history. And you seem to have been tied to finance and FinTech from a very early age. Tell me about your journey in FinTech and how it led up to Money Hub. Well, it's quite a journey. So uh, I have to go back a little way because I, I, I actually have a love of horses, which is got, has, has taken me on this journey where I've ended up where I am today and loving Money Hub, by the way. So being obsessed with horses as a child in a family that's not obsessed with horses uh, <laughs> is always a, a little odd. Um, but but the reason I bring it up is because uh, I certainly had to um, had to do I did a computer science degree at university, but only because my dad refused to let me go and ride race horses for a living at the age of seventeen. He's like, you must go to uni and like you know get a degree of some kind so that if you break your neck riding, you can um, you so know, you've got something plan. to fall back. Exactly, you've got a backup plan. And I think he was crossing his fingers, hoping that when when this daughter of his goes to university, this this horse infatuation will fall away and she'll she'll get on with real life. So the one thing that did happen is when I finished uni, I I didn't want to go and ride racehorses for a living. So that was good, that worked. Um, but uh, I I actually was in Austra Australian, you know, born and and live in the UK now. But uh, I went and my first job was a graduate programmer for Telstra, which is you know the main telecommunications company mm -hmm. in Australia. And I did that. But the thing that brought me to the UK, again, was my love of horses. So I had a, a very magical horse that was an ex-race horse. And uh, we were long listed for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. But in Australia, if you are to be shortlisted, you have to have competed internationally, which means the US or the UK for eventing. So I thought that's ridiculous. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, to fly a horse halfway around the world, um, anyone that knows eventing at all knows you fall off a lot. So it just seemed a very silly idea. So I thought, no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And my husband, actually, because we just got married, said to me, when you're in your rocking chair and you're 80, do you want to think about the things you could have done or the things you have done? And I thought, he is right. So that's it. So, that, so we packed up. We went to the UK with the horse. He, oh he, he's also, I met him at uni, so he's IT. So he contracted. I rode. Uh, I didn't get in the team, so that was quite a journey. Um, but I rode professionally, event-wise, for four years in the UK. 
loved every minute of it, wouldn't swap it for the world, but also realized when uh, I didn't get picked for the team that I didn't want to ride professionally forever. So I went back to my roots by my computing degree and and fell literally into a job um, because uh, a fellow Australian had gone back to Australia and left a vacancy at a, a, a local branch of Towers Perrin in, my, in Newbury. And, uh, and they just decided that, you know, I would fit the bill and could come in and, and do that. I, had, I didn't know what they did. It was just, I think they thought doing a swap for two Australians was a good idea. Yeah. And it's how it works. So, so I went and did that. But that's also part of the reason I think I love Money Hub so much because uh, I knew nothing about financial services and I joined a company that was financial services. So they built, you know, financial products for companies like the banks, you know, the building societies, they manufactured the products right at the base. So my first meeting with Barclays, I can still remember to this day, I went in and I sat there and when I came out with my colleagues, I had no idea like what they had been talking about, like n nothing. They could have been talking a foreign language. So I realized I had a lot to learn. And then my time at Towers, I say I grew up at Towers Perrin, which was fantastic, really good company, had a lovely time. But the more I did, the more I realized that for consumers, for people like you and me, that do not come with an actuarial background or a mathematical or investment background, we have absolutely no hope of knowing what to do with our money. And, and to another degree, may not, maybe we're not that bothered. Like money isn't why we live. We live because we enjoy living and doing what we're doing. The money's an enabler. And so this disconnect, it, it kind of bothered me. So yeah, so I've ended up in a place where I can, I can fix the bothering. So that lends me, leads me into the next question, which is how would you describe the mission of Money Hub to really drive that, that passion? Well, I think our statement kind of says it all. It's to enhance the lifetime financial wellness of people, their businesses, and their communities. So I kind of summarize that by saying it's to get everyone into the fields of financial wellness and to keep them there. That is fantastic. And I was going to ask you, could you summarize that for me? So you did a fantastic job with that piece of it. As you, as you look at the journey, and, and as you mentioned, starting out, basically being in a room where it could have been in a foreign language to where you're at now with Money Hub, if you could pick one lesson that was like really a turning point for you that you've seen throughout that, it could be recent, it could be long ago, but which, what would that be? So there's a lot, but well, one that's just sprung to mind when you, when you said that is when we were doing some work in the retirement space and we were trying to help people save more for their, in their pension. You know, there's a lot of benefits to pensions in terms of the tax breaks, the long-term side of it. Uh, the fact it is locked away, I know that's pretty scary, but there's, you know, it's good. You know, it, me it means this pot grows. So uh, we were doing a lot of work with, um, with people about why it was something that they were worried about doing or couldn't do. And uh, one of the ladies that I was um, spending some time with at the time said to me, she said, you know, it's all very well you having all these modelers and all this, you know, fancy stuff. And she said, but she said, I've got two kids. And she said, and unless you can figure out how to sell one of them for me, she said, there isn't any more money going into my pension. And it really hit home that some people, you know, just don't have any more money to put. So it's all very well us going on about how good it is. But if you are actually, you know, making ends meet from month to month and there isn't any spare, it doesn't matter how good it is, does it? No. So then that brings you back to the fact that you, you have to be able to help people at every step of the way. Otherwise, you can't help them put money into a pension because it's too far. It's too far of a leap from where she was. And that, re that really hit home at the time. Yeah, you know, that, that brings up a good point is that we, we tend to look at things in polar opposites, really. It's like you're, you're either here or you're there. And a lot of times the hardest step is just getting off of where you're at now yeah, and, and headed towards where you want to be mm -hmm. and not knowing what that first step is or how to approach it is a really, really big item. How is Money Hub enabling people to figure out? And, and there's a there's a famous neuroscientist that I love um, that I follow, and he always asks the question: If you want to go from A to B, what's the first thing that you do? And his answer is not be on A. So my question for you is: How does Money Hub get people not on A? So I think. 
the big thing about Money Hub is it's agnostic about where you are in your journey. So you can be in, you know, we talked a little earlier about the stressful swamps <laughs> from, from the Money Hub map. Uh, you, you know, to me, your relationship with money is a journey. You will sometimes, you know, be up and sometimes you'll be down. And that can be through no fault of your own, which is the other thing that upsets me a little bit. I think people think that bec- because people don't have any money or they've got into financial difficulty, somehow uh-huh. that reflects badly on them. But, you know, we've only got to look at COVID. You know, a lot of good businesses, a lot of people that were doing incredibly well. And suddenly, you know, overnight, pretty much, that, that isn't the scenario anymore. And it's not because they've done anything terrible. They, it's just it's just life, isn't it? So I think the one thing about Money Hub I love is that it will help you no matter where you are in that journey from just starting out with your money or wanting to actually make better investment decisions. It's very, very good at spanning that journey. So that's the first thing I would say. And then the second thing I would say is that part of the reason that we've kind of lost the savings kind of uh, culture is because of the, the rise of credit and lending. So if you think about the last, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, it's just so easy to, to be in debt. You know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible not to be in debt. I, I give an example when I first came to the UK and went in to get our sofas for the, the house and they're like, you know, it's 0% interest free, you know, and XYZ signed this contract for four years, um, uh, you know, or, or you could pay the full price. And I said, oh, well, I, I'll pay cash and can we have a discount? You know, thinking that's, that's how life works, right? And it's like, no, no, no. So it's either 0% interest-free for four years or you just pay the full price. And, and so I, I, I wanted to pay, I wanted to just pay. And then I thought, I, I can't because I can't pay when I can have a 0% interest-free for four years, right? I mean, yeah. I, just, I can't do it. But then, but then by definition, I've taken out credit. So what's interesting about that comment that you make there is the discussion I had with my, my 22-year-old uh, child is they're they're in that that area of not wanting to have any sort of credit card debt not wanting to have any debt of any sort because they've seen other people struggle with debt and when you start to talk about zero percent interest i even approach it from the perspective and i've talked to them about is if you look at what the average inflation rate is and if you can borrow the money at or below that interest rate you are actually decreasing the overall cost of the good that you're buying, thus getting a discount. Yeah. And so going through that process with them, it was really interesting. At that point, they're like, okay, now I get it. Yeah. So so it's very easy, but I think that has meant that our savings habit has, for two reasons, just we've kind of lost that savings habit, but also I think the world of products has made it difficult to save. And the reason I say that is because it's not, it's not very easy to save little bits of money. I mean, we, we've only recently seen the rounding up, you know, facility mm-hmm. and that type of thing. And I think in the UK, part of the reason we've been able to enable that is because of the payments legislation in terms of payment initiation services, whereby you can initiate a payment for someone and it can be 10p, you know, or it can be a pound, but it, it doesn't have to be a lot of money and it can be, you know, straight into the savings account. It can be swept away. So... I think there are some some really good things about the legislation that Money Hub's using to actually mm-hmm. what I call um like I, I just call it getting the savings habit back back in vogue you know so back in fashion. <laughs> are you struggling with payment technologies and feeling left behind in the digital commerce revolution? No worries. Let me introduce you to MPC 2023 the premier event for payments leaders. Mark your calendars for August 23rd through the 25th and join me and FinTech Confidential at the Westin Atlanta Perimeter North. When you sign up for FinTech Confidential notifications, you will receive a discount up to 100% off. Sign up now at www.fintechconfidential.com forward slash notifications. Don't let the future of commerce pass you by and join me at MPC in Atlanta from August 23rd through the 25th, where it's all about the movement of money. Well, what I see coming in the horizon from where I sit is a tsunami heading towards the consumer in terms of the consumer being in charge of their destiny, which I think is a fantastic tsunami. But what I think the companies are lacking is the vision to see that. So this explicit consumer consent versus implicit, I think is going to catch a lot of businesses out. So that's the big challenge I, 
I think companies are are having is that they say they're customer led or they say they're customer centric, but saying you're customer led or centric is very different to doing it. And I think it's because there's a lot of people in these big businesses who are genuinely wanting to help people, but the DNA of the businesses that they're in are product led. And so I think it's a massive challenge for a lot of businesses to get from a product led DNA, 250 mm -hmm. years of DNA, by mm -hmm. the way, you know, not just recently, to what I call a customer led DNA. And I think it's going to take a huge effort for the people at the top all the way through to really pull those companies through. And I, I personally believe only customer-led, customer-centric businesses will survive. I cannot see product-led businesses making it. It's interesting because as you're describing that in my head, I'm thinking about the current state of financial services in general. And it's not just in the US, it's, it's not just in the UK, it, it's all over the place that the ecosystem is just, it's, it's fractured, it's fragmented, it's disconnected. Um, in most cases, um, from the way that people want to see, use, monitor, and grow their money, what role do you see Money Hub being in trying to simplify that or help move them forward um, in that journey? So I think one of the key um, roles we've got to play is helping businesses become more customer centric and so making that easier for them. Because everything about our platform is all about the customer having that control and going back to what we talked about before, how it's incredibly agnostic about where you are on the journey. So it'll help you get from, we talked A to B. So right. it's, a, you know, it's going to help you get from A to B, whatever your A to B is at the moment. And that's what I think more businesses need to do rather than focusing on what is it that I need to sell to someone in order for me to do well. Because... Otherwise, you are always looking at a certain target market, and I think that's very short-sighted for financial services, where actually, by actually you know, helping people get from A to B, even if it's not your A to B as a business, but then we talk about how that gets you to C to D to E, mm -hmm. and maybe the D to E is exactly what you need. So you've taken all those customers with you on that journey, and I think that's trust and that's loyalty at its very heart. So that's... That's quite difficult for businesses to do, but I think that's where Money Hub really helps them to do that. So you'd mentioned Money Hub leveraging the legislation in the UK to really provide some additional value. How do you see Money Hub continuing to lead in the the lending management, the the data analytics stuff, um, to continue to deliver better experiences? It's just, it's all about the data. So, you know, we don't have enough data scientists probably in the world, you know, for us all to do what we need to do with the data. But to me, the data is, is key because without being able to provide insight about the data, you can't help anyone. Uh, going back to, you know, money being an enabler, you know, you, we have to help people. I, I think I, I liken it to a car with ABS. You know, I, you know, I, I don't, I have I actually don't even know what it stands for. I, I just think it's much safer, I think, from what I've understood. But I certainly wouldn't have ever come up with a, a request for that in my car. But the industry, the car industry must have, you know, decided or known it was a, something that they needed to be better and could, could you know, do a lot for the, the vehicles. Otherwise, I don't think we'd have it because I, I can't be alone on not knowing what ABS is. So um, I just think it's a bit like that with money. There's, there's a group of us that know about money and we need to do the best we can. And, and then there's you know, 90% of the population that j just need what we provide them to enable them to be good with their money and, be, and have better outcomes every step of the way. So you had a session here at MXS um, and, and we're, couldn't have been a better location. We're in the mountains of Utah with, with the trees just starting to turn for the fall. What do you hope that the attendees from the session that you had on I'm going to summarize because it was a really long title, but how blurry the the rules to the road had become in the U.S. and what what we could learn from from elsewhere. What do you what would you expect? What would you want them to walk away with? I think really explicit consumer consent. So if you place the consumer or the customer at the heart of what you do in terms of transparency and knowledge for them, 
then you are in effect uh, developing the trust with that customer. And if we look at the World Economic Forums for the last three years, they have said that uh, the new currency, you know, isn't actually crypto, it's trust. So I, I think that's what we've got to take away from this conference, which I think MX would be incredibly aligned to my thinking in terms of, you know, it's trust and it's about the consumer and it's about better outcomes. That's fantastic. If you were to be sitting down with a handful of startup founders that have got all these really cool ideas about how to bridge the gap between all of these products and, and services in the marketplace and they were coming to you and saying, here's the customer problem that I'm trying to solve. And I've done all this research and I've, I figured out exactly the problem that I need to solve. What bit of advice would you want to give them as they head out on that journey? Uh, so MVP? To keep them out of the pits of despair. Yeah. I had to throw that one in. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the minimal, don't lose sight of minimal viable product. And each is very critical. The minimum viable has to be viable and product. So, and it's an it's a evolution. You you can never come up with the product o- overnight. It's not possible. So if you take those incremental steps and you you know work always with the customer. So you know genuinely you know th- the only way you can evolve something is with real people that you're wanting to solve those problems with. That's the best you can get. You know you're 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 at the coal face with the customer, solving the problem that you want to solve with them, and you're listening and developing your product as you go. To solve the problem, right? So, I think the big the big pitfall is you ha- have a big idea, and um, you spend a lot of time developing a product, but you haven't really done it with the customer. I think yeah. the customer is key. That is fantastic. Well, Sam, we've had we've gone through a bunch of stuff. I really enjoyed learning about how horses <laughs> turned into fintech. That was so fantastic. Is there anything that, that you wanted to make sure that, that we, we talked about that maybe I didn't ask a question about? Uh, not really, apart from uh, just, I think, to take away that it doesn't, your journey, where, where whatever it is, so we talk about the A to B, uh, I think when you listen to so many people and myself included, that journey can be, you know, can be quite, you know, up and down and around. And so I think you should take heart from all these people that, my, my view is that everything along that journey is for a reason and it's taking you to the next place where at some point you may not understand quite you know, what's happening, but at some point you're going to look back and go, that's why that happened. You know, that's why I did that and that's why that's happened. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, I would say just hang on to that through the journey because um, I think ev- anyone can, can get from you know, A to B. It just, it just doesn't feel like it all the time, but, but it's possible. What is the best way for people to, to learn more about Money Hub? and how to get in touch with the team to see if there's something that, uh, that is there for them. So I think the website is always a good place to start, but you know, we're on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you know, anywhere like that. Wherever you, wherever you connect with, then you know, connect with Money Hub. So you know, that's what I would say. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate so much for you taking the time out and hopefully you have straight, safe travels home. Yeah, thank you, thank you for having me. It's great. Are you struggling with payment technologies and feeling left behind in the digital commerce revolution? No worries. Let me introduce you to MPC 2023, the premier event for payments leaders. Mark your calendars for August 23rd through the 25th and join me and FinTech Confidential at the Westin Atlanta Perimeter North. When you sign up for FinTech Confidential notifications, you will receive a discount up to 100% off. Sign up now at www.fintechconfidential.com forward slash notifications. Don't let the future of commerce pass you by and join me at MPC in Atlanta from August 23rd through the 25th, where it's all about the movement of money. This has been a production of Diamond D3 Media with all rights reserved. This is provided for informational purposes only. It is not offered or intended to be used as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. We strive to provide accurate and up-to-date information, but will not be responsible for any missing facts or inaccurate information. You comply and understand that you should use any of this information at your own risk. Cryptocurrencies are highly volatile financial assets, so research and make your own financial decisions.